Final Fantasy IV was an absolute revolution. It's the first game in the series to deliver the kind of epic story, iconic characters and exciting gameplay that people have come to expect out of a Final Fantasy game. And for many fans, this is where the series truly began. In this retrospective, I'll show you what the game was like, talk about its confusing history and why there were three different versions of the game released in the same year, and finally explain why Final Fantasy IV became the blueprint to Square's success, and the foundation upon which the rest of the series was built. But before we talk about Final Fantasy IV, we first must talk about Final Fantasy II. By now, most fans are well aware that Final Fantasy IV was once known in the West as Final Fantasy II. But it actually gets even more complicated than that. The original Final Fantasy was a big hit in North America, so it might seem strange that the two sequels never made it out of Japan. But when you look at the facts, it makes perfect sense. A common meme that's been going around since the 90s is that Square didn't have faith that the titles would do well outside of Japan. But the truth is, it was just a matter of timing. Game development moved a lot faster in the 80s and 90s. There's actually only 9 years separating the original Final Fantasy from Final Fantasy VII. And Final Fantasy I only made it to North America in July of 1990, two and a half years after its Japanese release. And Square did have plans to release the second game in North America, even going so far as to have a translated prototype made up called Final Fantasy II Dark Shadow over Palakia. But on July 19th, 1991, Final Fantasy IV was released in Japan for the Super Famicom, just one year after Final Fantasy I came out in North America. Faced with a choice of where to put their resources, Square made the decision to cancel the North American version of Final Fantasy II and instead translate Final Fantasy IV. But now they had a bit of a problem. Since only the first game had made its way to North America before, Square were rightly worried that going from Final Fantasy I to Final Fantasy IV would confuse potential customers. To avoid this, they decided to release Final Fantasy IV in North America as Final Fantasy II. Ironically, this decision would go on to cause massive confusion within the fanbase for decades to come. Obviously, the North American version had to be translated into English, and certain changes had to be made to fit regional requirements, such as Nintendo of America's famously strict content guidelines that forbade games from including excessive violence or sexually suggestive themes. But the changes made to the North American version of Final Fantasy IV went far beyond what you'd normally expect. It wasn't just the name of the game that had the potential to cause confusion. Final Fantasy IV is a lot more complex than the original Final Fantasy, and while Japanese players had gotten used to the learning curve with the two sequels for the NES, Square were worried that Western players who got thrown right into the deep end of the pool after only getting their feet wet with the original game would sink rather than swim. To help newcomers adjust to the series, they decided to make some changes to the North American version. A lot of changes, actually. Monster stats were toned down, some boss encounters got nerfed, and a ton of items and abilities were removed to help streamline combat. Basically, the idea was to simplify the game. Or, if you prefer, make the game easier. But here's where the story gets kind of ridiculous because Square didn't just make a North American version of the game. They also produced a third version of the game, to be released in Japan. This version included many of the adjustments made to the North American edition, along with some more changes meant to ease the player through certain parts of the game. It also simplified a lot of the original Japanese text, replacing complicated words with more common synonyms, so that young children would have an easier time following the story. This new Japanese version of the game would be marketed to beginners to the RPG genre as well as children, and it was called Final Fantasy IV Easy Type. I'm not kidding, that's the actual name on the box. Final Fantasy IV Easy Type was released in Japan on October 19, 1991, exactly three months after the release of the original version. Final Fantasy IV was then released in North America as Final Fantasy II on November 21st, just about a month later. 
while the three initial versions of Final Fantasy IV are all different from each other in various ways, they are all fundamentally the same great JRPG. While I'll be calling the game Final Fantasy IV from now on, the version of the game I'll be focusing on is the North American edition. For better or worse, this is the game that got Western fans hooked on JRPGs, developed a cult following outside of Japan, and helped establish Final Fantasy as the new standard in video game storytelling. I will, however, generally use the original Japanese names for characters, items, and locations. Hopefully it won't get too confusing. Regardless of which version of the game you play, there's one thing they all have in common. This is something that was made possible not just by the combined talents of the development team, but by the massive boost in hardware they got with the Super Nintendo. The jump from Nintendo to Super Nintendo gave Final Fantasy IV a big boost to its graphics. Towns and dungeons are much more elaborate and detailed. The environments show a lot more variation than before, with everything from the standard caves and brick-walled castles to eye-catching sci-fi installations with gleaming metal corridors. The game also took great advantage of the Super Nintendo's more advanced picture processing unit, which made the environments come alive with animated waterfalls, pulsing electric lights, and thick mist. Some areas even use parallax scrolling in its backgrounds, resulting in some really cool effects, like the rolling clouds behind the airship in the opening sequence, the forested landscape that slides by far below as you climb the mountains, and my personal favorite, the Land of Summoned Monsters, where the town spreads out in stacked layers of floating platforms beneath your feet. In Final Fantasy III, the dungeons all felt flat, even in the areas where elevation was a key component, like the Dragon's Peak Mountain. Final Fantasy IV's dungeons were able to convey depth, often giving the illusion of a three-dimensional space. Caves are separated into high ground and low ground, with steps leading between them. Some dungeons let you climb into the water to proceed, and mountain areas are split into stacked terraces, really selling the idea that you're scaling a peak. In the NES games, heroes and monsters did battle on a black canvas with a simple banner across the top to indicate the terrain. In Final Fantasy IV, for the first time, battle arenas got fully illustrated backgrounds for each of the game's terrains. The backgrounds are vivid and colorful and make combat feel a lot more real. The characters' sprites got bigger and benefited from a wider color palette. But they didn't just look good, they also had some nice moves. Attack animations and weapon effects are more impressive, and characters even have idle animations while readying spells or attacks. A feature made necessary by the game's biggest change to combat, which we'll get to later. The Super Nintendo's enhanced graphics also helped make one of Final Fantasy's iconic features much more memorable. When the heroes take flight in one of the game's airships, the world map zooms out, showing the world from a whole new perspective. Go ahead and laugh, but this was really, really cool back in 1991. As impressive as the new graphics were, they were nothing compared to the gains made in another area. Composer Nobuo Uematsu had been with Final Fantasy since the very beginning. While the original Final Fantasy soundtrack showed promise, it was the product of an inexperienced composer who was still finding his way, and the limitations of the primitive NES sound chip made the task that much harder. The soundtracks of Final Fantasy 2 and 3 were each leaps and bounds better than the previous game, but they were nothing compared to what Uematsu would achieve with Final Fantasy 4. For the series' first entry for the Super Nintendo, Uematsu produced a soundtrack that was exciting, cinematic, and unbelievably awesome. The music of Final Fantasy IV has so much variation and depth. The Red Wings theme is dramatic and grand, setting the stage for the story right from the start. The battle themes bounce with energy and excitement. And the final battle slaps just as hard as the game's story this serves. The individual compositions were great, but the true strength of the game's soundtrack was in how it was used. Drawing inspiration from the way music is used to enhance the experience in movies, many of the pieces were made to convey specific emotions at just the right time, capturing the story's feelings better than words ever could. Compared to the previous games, 
everything about Final Fantasy IV's soundtrack was plus-sized. For the first time, the tracks were good enough to repeat endlessly in dungeons and towns without ever getting annoying, and many of them can still be enjoyed outside of the game in their original unarranged form, which is more than you can say for the NES soundtracks. Compared to the previous titles, Final Fantasy IV looks and sounds like a totally different game. But when you see past all of the many changes introduced in Final Fantasy IV, there is one thing that still remained very much the same. When it comes to the core gameplay, Final Fantasy IV sticks very close to the basic formula established in the first Final Fantasy. You control a party of heroes who fight monsters, gain experience and level up to become stronger. There's a massive world to explore, and just like in the previous game, it's split into several distinct maps, starting with the surface world, then revealing a hidden underworld, and ending with an exploration of the moon. You start the game by traveling on foot or by riding chocobos, and Final Fantasy IV is a mostly linear experience. But once you get your hands on the first airship, the world opens up quite a bit, with optional locations to explore, secret bosses to fight, and rare treasure to claim. Towns provide a safe haven where you can rest, buy weapons, armor and healing items, and gather information. But most of the game still takes place in dungeons, which must be explored to advance the story. Battles are fought in random encounters with monsters that can either be defeated or escaped, and most dungeons have one or more required boss encounters along the way. You'll also spend a lot of time in the game's menu, where you can organize your party, equip weapons and armor, cast spells and use items. This game was the first in the series to introduce something we now take for granted. A configuration menu, where you can change in-game options like battle speed, sound output and even the window color. Another cool little innovation is an improvement to the save menu. For the first time, you can actually see how many minutes and hours you put into the game right there on your save file. I didn't realize how much I missed this feature until I didn't have it in the first three games. While the core gameplay has a very familiar feel to it, once you actually get into the game, Final Fantasy IV plays a lot different than its predecessors. That's because this game did something that goes against the very nature of an RPG. It took away a lot of your choice. Because the team behind Final Fantasy IV wanted to tell an engaging, emotional story inspired by books and movies, they had to figure out a solution to a pretty big problem. How can you tell a great story if you don't know who the story's about? The first three Final Fantasy games were all about player freedom, and the heroes were basically blank slates for you to develop as you wished. Without things like voice acting or advanced graphics to help develop the characters, a game like Final Fantasy IV had to get creative, and that meant making some sacrifices. Final Fantasy IV's solution was simple, but it's a decision that had a huge impact, not only on the game, but on the Final Fantasy series as a whole. This game is the first in the series where the characters you control are not defined by your choices, Instead, Square took the job system from Final Fantasy III and assigned each character a fixed job. Kane is a dragoon, Rosa is a white mage, and Rydia is a summoner. Each of the game's 12 playable characters has their own attributes and abilities, and which characters are in your party at any given time is decided entirely by the story. Final Fantasy IV is all about making the most of what you have. Even though the game doesn't give you a lot of choice, that doesn't mean your party isn't dynamic. Including the start of the game, your party lineup changes a total of 24 times throughout the story, and each of those changes is an opportunity to try something new. Every character brings something different to the table. As a Dark Knight, Cecil is built like a tank, and he does some serious damage with his dark swords. He loses a bit of his raw power when he becomes a paladin, but gains the ability to tank damage for his allies and can do some basic healing through his white magic spells. Kane is a dragoon. He wears heavy armor and fights well with a spear, but he also has some serious juice with his jump ability, which lets him delay his attack to deal extra damage. 
this is a great option against enemies with powerful counterattacks or bomb type enemies that will self destruct after they take a hit. Yang is a monk. He can't wear a lot of armor, but he has a ton of hit points, can fight barehanded or dual wield claws, and can use the kick ability to deal damage to all enemies on the screen. Rosa and Purim are both white mages, but they play a bit differently. Rosa's healing magic is stronger, and she can wield bows to deal some extra damage from the back row. And Purim can combine with her twin brother Palam for a devastating spell that wipes the floor with the enemies, but quickly drains both of their MP. Some characters are definitely better than others, and the game's difficulty depends a lot on who's in your party at the time. Tella is extremely useful. As a sage, he can use white magic to heal the party and black magic to destroy your enemies. In contrast, Edward kind of sucks. He's not a great fighter, he's got no magic, and he'll hide from battle if his hit points drop low. You'll spend most of your time with Edward wishing he was literally anyone else. Not all characters are created equal, but they all have their uses. Your enjoyment of the game really depends a lot on how willing you are to adjust your tactics to meet the situation, rather than stubbornly sticking to your preferred playstyle. If the concept of Final Fantasy III was change your party to fit the situation, then Final Fantasy IV's concept is change your tactics to fit your party. With each twist and turn of the game's story comes changes to your team, so you're constantly presented with new characters to learn, new spells and abilities to master, and new challenges to overcome. Even though Final Fantasy IV lets you control up to five characters at the same time, the most out of any mainline Final Fantasy title, the game's fixed character jobs and limited party customization means that Final Fantasy IV offers less choice than arguably any other game in the series. But limited player choice was a price the designers were willing to pay. What they lost in gameplay, they would make up for with story. And Square still had an ace up their sleeve. An idea so powerful it would change the series forever. By far the most significant change the game made to the Final Fantasy formula was the introduction of Active Time Battle. The three NES games all used a fully turn-based system where you gave commands to all four heroes before the start of each round of combat. Monsters and heroes then took turns attacking, casting spells or using special abilities until everyone had made a move. Although this system was meant to be strategic, most battles really only came down to attacking with all of your characters and maybe casting a spell here and there. But instead of innovating on the turn-based model, Final Fantasy IV went in a different direction. Active Time Battle was conceived as a hybrid system, which combined elements of turn-based combat with something from an action game. In Final Fantasy IV, characters still take turns, and you still give them orders from a list of commands, but now battles play out in real time. Each character has a hidden action bar that fills up over time, and they get to make a move when it's full. But since the monsters no longer wait around for you to make up your mind, you have to think fast and act quickly. The original inspiration for Active Time Battle came from an unexpected place. The game's battle designer, Hiroyuki Ito, who would later serve as director of Final Fantasy VI, Final Fantasy IX, and Final Fantasy XII, came up with the idea while watching TV. Specifically, Formula One Racing. As Ito watched the faster cars overtake the slower ones, he had the idea of a combat system where different characters would act at different speeds, with some being able to attack faster or even more often than others. ATB made battles feel dynamic and exciting. Now that enemies acted on their own time, you had to react to situations as they came up and make snap decisions to stay alive. If an ally took a nasty blow, you could respond with an immediate healing spell. But if the attack was dodged, you could cast haste instead. Suddenly, timing mattered. Not just what you did, but when you did it. And in some fights, it could be critical. People often call Final Fantasy IV's first boss a tutorial battle, and this is true. Although the Mist Dragon doesn't put up much of a fight, it does have a gimmick. In its mist form, the boss gains a powerful counterattack. Since you won't know exactly when the dragon will turn to mist, getting too aggressive can be dangerous. 
This is an important lesson, because ATB requires the player to master timing. A great example is the fight with Leviathan. The trick is to pace your moves with the boss's actions, and get into a good rhythm. If you can get your healing spells to pop right after Leviathan's tidal wave attack, you'll turn a tricky fight into a cakewalk. ATB also allowed for complex new ideas that hadn't been possible in the previous turn-based battle systems. Spells and abilities could be balanced not just by how strong or costly they were, but also by how fast they came out. Some enemies could be strong but slow, while others were fast but weak. Other enemies could be given dangerous counterattacks that triggered if they were hit by certain types of attacks. And the system also paved the way for clever new special attacks, like the Morbles Digest, which does damage over time, and Death Sentence, which literally puts an expiry date on the target. Haste and Slow now actually make the target act faster or slower, instead of just boosting or cutting their damage. Even the Defend command got a bit more useful, since it comes out immediately and lasts until the character's next turn. And Running from Battle now works in real time. And there's a real sense of tension as you wait to see if the heroes will make it away before the monsters strike again. This first version of Active Time Battle was clever and ambitious, but it wasn't perfect. The delay between picking an action and seeing it come out is way too long, and it makes combat feel clunky. Unlike later versions of ATB, you can't see the action bars fill up, so it's kind of hard to plan ahead. And while the new combat system opened up a world of new possibilities, Final Fantasy IV honestly barely scratches the surface. But there is one fight in the game that took the concept and did it really well. The one boss that everyone who's ever played Final Fantasy IV remembers. As you're leaving the sealed cave, you'll run into the Demon Wall. A literal wall that slowly but surely inches towards your party. And if you can't kill it before it gets too close, you'll just die. It's a super tense, unique experience that was only made possible by active time battle. And even 30 years later, this battle still gets the blood pumping like crazy. In Final Fantasy IV, lack of choice is almost a design philosophy. You cannot choose your characters or their jobs, you no longer decide what spells to learn since characters learn magic as they level up, and even the party formation is not entirely in your hands since you're restricted to one of two possible setups. What's interesting is that the North American version took this philosophy to even greater extremes. Because a lot of the options you had as a player actually got removed from this version of the game. And the most obvious of these changes is something you'd notice the moment you get into your first real battle. In the Japanese version of the game, Cecil has a special ability called Darkness. This attack fires a wave of dark energy that hits every enemy on the screen. It's a great way to wipe out a crowd of weaker enemies, but it comes at a cost. Each time Cecil uses darkness, he loses some of his hit points. This ability was removed from the North American version, but it's far from the only one. In fact, most of the game's cast ended up losing some of their skills. Tella had Recall, which would cast a random spell, including some he couldn't normally use. Edward had Medicine, which restored a small number of hit points to all party members. And Rosa's Prey ability could give you a free healing spell if you got lucky. These extra abilities don't make a world of difference, but they added options to the original version's combat. And in some cases, losing them really messes with the flow of the game. This is especially true for Dark Knight Cecil, who was left with nothing but his standard attack. You spend a lot of time with Cecil in the early stages of the game, and having even one more option in combat really makes those first few hours a lot more fun. The decision to remove a bunch of abilities might seem strange, but it kinda makes sense when you look at what Square were going for, which was to offer a simplified version of the game that would be more accessible to newcomers. Darkness is very useful, but paying for an ability with your own character's life might have confused a lot of beginners. Edward's medicine ability seems fine, until you realize that it actually removes a potion from your inventory every time you use it, which the game doesn't even tell you about. 
And sure, Teller's recall command sounds cool, but it's mostly just frustrating, since the chances of getting anything good are next to nothing. But these lost abilities aren't the only combat options that got cut from the North American version. We also need to talk about all the items that disappeared from your inventory. The Japanese version of Final Fantasy IV had a ton of different consumable items that you could use in and out of combat. There were items that copied the effects of spells, like the Bomb Fragment, Antarctic Wind, and Hermes Shoes. There were items that cured specific conditions, like the Antidote, Eye Drops, and Maiden's Kiss. And there were even some special items, like the Soma Drop and the Gold Apple, which would permanently increase a character's MP or hit points. In the effort to streamline and simplify the experience, more than 40 different items from the original game were dumped on the way to North America. Status curing items were all baked into a single item called Heal, which would cure any and all conditions. All the items that mimicked spell effects were ripped out, and you can forget about permanently boosting your stats. This spring cleaning of the inventory had some interesting consequences. The lack of damage items like the Bomb Fragment made the more straightforward characters like Cecil and Kane a bit less interesting to play, and access to a cheap and reliable cure-all item for status conditions made some parts of the game a lot less painful. Try dealing with the Morbel enemy when your only healer gets hit with a bad breath, which inflicts pretty much every negative status condition in the game at the same time. Another unintended but very welcome effect of the North American item apocalypse is how much easier inventory management got. To help solve the issue of limited space, Final Fantasy III introduced the Fat Chocobo. Final Fantasy IV kept this feature, but with so many of those useful one-shot items from the previous game gone, along with a slightly bigger inventory, the Fat Chocobo got downgraded from an absolute necessity to a mere curiosity. Between missing items and lost abilities, the North American version stripped the game of a lot of options. But that doesn't mean the combat got boring. Because in spite of all the complexity that was lost, defeating Final Fantasy IV's monsters still demanded a lot more from you than the previous games ever did. While the previous Final Fantasy games could be tough to get through, it was more about endurance than skill. Most battles didn't require a whole lot of strategy, rather it was the journey that mattered. How many hit points you lost each time you fought, and how many healing spells and items you had to burn to survive. Final Fantasy IV started the shift towards a more skill-based playstyle, where you had to treat every battle as its own individual challenge. Now, different monsters demand different tactics, and a lot of the game comes down to learning how to deal with them. Most enemies have some sort of weak spot. Reptiles are weak to ice, undead take tons of damage from fire, and sea monsters die to lightning. With a party of five characters, each with their own weapons, spells, and abilities, you usually have plenty of options for exploiting these weaknesses. Many weapons are also extra effective against certain types of enemies, and you can switch weapons in the middle of a fight to hit a monster where it really hurts. Some enemies require special care. The Lamia counters every attack with its very dangerous charm spell. Bomb-type enemies will self-destruct if you don't finish them off fast enough, and if you see a Coral, you'd better take it down first, since its blaster attack will instantly kill whoever it hits. There's over 150 different enemies to encounter in Final Fantasy IV, and learning how to deal with each one is kind of what makes combat fun. But the best moments come when all of these different factors collide at once, and battles become all about priorities. And since active time battle puts you on a clock, you now have to figure this out in real time. It's hectic, fun, and really satisfying when you get it right. And we haven't even talked about the most important battles yet. Boss fights in the first three games were usually all about finding ways to survive the insane damage the boss monsters could dish out. Final Fantasy IV really ramped things up by introducing all sorts of complications to these critical encounters, and some of the boss fights play out almost like a puzzle you need to solve before you can beat the boss. 
the arch fiend of water, Cagnasso, goes through a routine where he'll gather a shield of water around himself and then unleash a tsunami that deals a ton of damage to the whole party, but hit him with a lightning spell while he's got his shield up and he'll have to start all over again. The Magus sisters can combine for a powerful delta attack, but the real problem is that one of the sisters will revive the others if they're defeated, so you'll have to figure that one out before you can even start to make progress. But there's also plenty of times when Final Fantasy IV's combat feels rough around the edges. The Antlion has a powerful counterattack, but there's really not much you can do to work around it. The CPU in the Giant of Babel can be fun to figure out, but once you know what to do to keep from getting nuked, the rest of the fight's just a boring slog. And more often than not, the game's winning strategy is just to cast Berserk on your fighters for that bonus damage. Final Fantasy IV's big power move is literally to give up control of your characters, and that's deeply ironic. Active Time Battle was one of those ideas that's so clever it seems obvious in hindsight, but even this very first iteration of ATB was a massive revolution, and it came with a great payoff. Final Fantasy IV's Final Battle is everything you want out of a climactic JRPG end boss, a cosmic horror of epic proportions, an amazing soundtrack that drives urgency and drama straight into your bones, a desperate fight that keeps you on your toes forces you to put everything you've learned about the combat system to the test and pushes you right to the edge. And when you strike that final blow and Zeromus sinks into oblivion beneath the sea of stars, there's that overwhelming feeling of relief. A feeling that you just accomplished something worth doing. Something worth remembering. A fitting end to an epic story. But before we dive into Final Fantasy IV's spectacular story, I need to talk about the places where most of it is told, because this game also made some much needed improvements to Final Fantasy's dungeon design. At first glance, Final Fantasy IV's dungeons don't seem all that different from the ones in the previous games. You explore dark caves, mountain trails, and futuristic towers with multiple floors and screens. There's plenty of branching passages, secrets to find, and optional treasure to pick up. But unlike something from a Zelda game, there are no puzzles or lock and key mechanics to solve. Instead, it's mostly just a matter of finding the path forward while dealing with the game's very, very frequent random encounters. Because just like in the first three games, the dungeons in Final Fantasy IV are really all about one thing. Survival. The dungeons in the three Final Fantasy games for the NES were built to be a test of endurance. You carefully pick your path through the dungeon, run from the battles that aren't worth it, take a beating each time you do fight, and burn through healing items and potions just to stay on your feet. Without any reliable means of restoring your magic points, dungeons became gauntlets to endure and defeat. This design style encouraged planning, patience, and sheer stubborn determination. And it made the decision to go for one of the dungeon's more remote treasure chests truly meaningful, since a single mistake could send you all the way back to the nearest town. Final Fantasy IV's dungeons are still a mostly old-school experience, but they're actually a lot more forgiving than the ones from the previous games. Because this is where the Final Fantasy series finally introduced something we take for granted in modern JRPGs. Something that would have made the first three games a completely different experience. Save points. Pretty much all of the game's dungeons have at least one save point somewhere along the way, usually before the boss. Besides functioning as a checkpoint in case you die or have to turn off your console, save points also let you use a tent or a cottage to restore your party's HP and MP. Mid-dungeon save points were a huge quality of life improvement, but of course it came at a cost. You no longer got that same feeling of accomplishment you got from beating the long, dangerous dungeons of the previous games. But adding save points didn't take all of the tension out of dungeon crawling, 
In a way, having save points allowed the game to ramp up the complexity and scope of the dungeons and the boss battles, by taking advantage of the fact that there are checkpoints along the way. And this is especially true of the game's final dungeon, which features some optional challenges that would be downright dirty without a save point to fall back on. While save points were a feature included in the original Japanese version of the game, other changes to the dungeon crawling experience were introduced in the North American translation, and one of these so-called improvements took things a bit too far. Final Fantasy 2 and 3 introduced hidden passages. These were places where the walls looked solid, but you could actually walk right through them. While some hidden passages had slight tells, most of them were impossible to tell apart from ordinary walls. The original Japanese version of Final Fantasy IV still had these hidden passages, but with only a few exceptions, the North American version gave it all away. To help guide less experienced players through the game, hidden passages were given lighter color tiles to help them stand out. It's not such a weird change when you consider that hidden passages were an important feature in Final Fantasy 2 and 3, but did not exist in the original Final Fantasy, the only game in the series Western players would have been familiar with at the time. But I do think completely exposing the game's hidden passages was a mistake and the few hidden passages that actually remain secret do feel pretty rewarding to find. But the most significant way Final Fantasy IV changed how players interacted with its dungeons was something that happened almost by accident. Again, this was something unique to the North American version of the game, but unlike the other changes, this one would go on to have a permanent impact on the Final Fantasy series. The North American version made a lot of changes to the actual game balance. Monster stats were scaled back, some special attacks were toned down, and many enemies, especially bosses, had their hit points drastically reduced. The result is that when you compare Final Fantasy IV to its three predecessors, it plays a lot different in one key area. The amount of grinding you have to do to get through the game. For the first time in the series, the average player could actually beat the game simply by going through the story and doing a reasonable bit of exploration. The fact is that Final Fantasy IV feels like a much shorter game than the previous titles. Each of the three NES games took me about 25 to 30 hours to beat, but about one third of all that time was spent grinding. For comparison, I finished Final Fantasy IV in just under 20 hours. And the difference is that I didn't do any grinding at all. Over the years, much has been said about the decision to dumb down the North American version of Final Fantasy IV. And sure, when you're coming off of the NES games, Final Fantasy IV feels easy. But let's be honest, the previous games weren't so much hard as they were frustrating. With the North American version of Final Fantasy IV, Square finally found their sweet spot, a more lenient, less punishing kind of Final Fantasy, a game that appealed to a much wider audience than just the core crowd of hardcore RPG fanatics. And for better or worse, it was this more accessible difficulty level that ultimately became the model for Final Fantasy's golden age. Softer monsters, save points and not-so-hidden passages made Final Fantasy IV's dungeons a lot less painful to get through. But the biggest improvement was in how the game's dungeons were used. Most of Final Fantasy's gameplay had always taken place in dungeons, but this time around, the dungeons were actually used to tell a lot of the game's story. The mysterious phantom beast calls out to Cecil and Cain as they make their way through the mist cave. Cecil and Tella talk around the campfire while you rest at the save point in the watery pass. And the Tower of Babel is long and challenging, but it's also filled with big revelations, heroic sacrifices, and daring last-minute escapes. Final Fantasy IV's dungeons worked overtime to deliver a much more involving experience than what had been seen in the previous titles. They really had to, because this was a fundamentally different game. Final Fantasy IV tells the story of Cecil Harvey, a dark knight in the service of the Kingdom of Baron, 
and captain of the airship squadron, the Red Wings. After being ordered to steal one of the world's elemental crystals from the peaceful people of Mysidia, Cecil has a crisis of conscience. When he voices his doubts, the king strips him of his command of the Red Wings and sends him on a mission to deliver a mysterious package to the village of Mist. A mission with an unexpected outcome that will change Cecil forever. Over the course of the story, Cecil renounces his evil ways, becomes a paladin fighting for truth and justice, and assembles a team of unlikely heroes to oppose the mysterious evil force that threatens to tear the world apart. The story sounds basic by today's standards, but it was revolutionary for its time, not because of the individual ideas, but for how the story was told. Where the previous three games dropped you right into the gameplay almost from the word go, Final Fantasy IV sets the stage with an elaborate six minute opening sequence that introduces the game's hero, the world he inhabits, and the game's underlying conflict. Final Fantasy IV took cutscenes to the next level. They're more frequent, there's a lot more dialogue, and many scenes have tension and power, and are full of great surprises. Scenes like Cecil and Kane parlaying between two airship in mid-flight, Rydia calling Titan to attack the heroes after they unwittingly destroy her village, and Palom and Porum sacrificing themselves to save the others in Castle Baron were miles ahead of anything in the first three games. Rydia's surprise return in the Underworld, Sid rescuing the heroes from the Tower of Babel, and Cain's betrayal at Fabul were dramatic, exciting, and for the time, utterly unexpected. For the first time in the Final Fantasy series, the game also uses its combat system to help tell the story. When Rydia attacks Cecil and Cain in Mist, it's not just another cutscene, but a battle. The outcome is the same no matter what you do, but the combat setting helps make the scene come alive in ways an ordinary cutscene never could. And when soldiers from Baron come for Rydia in the town of Kaipo, you're the one who wields the sword that cuts them down. By making you an active participant in Cecil's betrayal, his choice is made so much more powerful. Earlier I said that much of Final Fantasy IV's story was told in its dungeons, but this game also introduced some of Final Fantasy's first fully-fledged scenarios, like the Siege of Fabul, where the heroes engage in a series of back-to-back -back battles to defend the Wind Crystal from the forces of Baron. These set-piece scenarios helped to break up the monotony of dungeon crawling, and kept you guessing throughout the game. Still, Final Fantasy IV's very best moment came in one of its dungeons. The confrontation with the evil Golbez at the top of the Tower of Zot is a whirlwind of twists and turns. In the span of a few short minutes, we get a tragic sacrifice, a false victory, the near death of the protagonist, a traitor turned back to the hero's cause, a tearful reunion, a surprise boss encounter, and a last second escape. And just as you're catching your breath, the game drops a huge twist. I've played this game many times before, but this sequence still had me on the edge of my seat. In moments like these, you can forget that Final Fantasy IV is over 30 years old, but there are times when it's painfully obvious that this is a game from 1991. And by far the worst thing that was done to Final Fantasy IV is something unique to the North American version. It's not the abilities lost, the items removed, or even the stuff that was censored. I am talking about what was lost in translation. Before I go on, I just want to say if you enjoyed this video, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment, as it really helps the video reach more people. And if you want to support me, consider subscribing to my channel so I know people want to see more videos like this. Final Fantasy IV has had a bunch of versions over the years, and all of them have slightly different English translations. Some are more faithful to the source material, while others have more charm. What the newer translations all have in common is that they are a huge upgrade over the original North American translation. Because the English script that was produced for the Super Nintendo version is unbelievably bad. All the characters sound the same, some of the plot points are harder to follow, and tons of character development and backstory got cut, 
like Cain explaining why he became a dragoon, or Cecil mentioning that the King of Baron took him and Cain in as orphans and raised them as his own children. Missing lines or simple mistakes can be forgiven, but what cannot be excused is just how goofy the English text is. Final Fantasy IV's characters sound like aliens who read about humans but have never heard them speak before. When discussing how to fight back against Baron, Cecil says, Baron's main force is the Red Wings. The sea power is relatively weak. Let's make it on the sea. At Mysidia, some guy tells Cecil, Just endure the time of trial and get away from your mind of darkness. And then there's the guard who tries to explain who the eight priestesses of Toroya are. Our clerics are sisters of eight. They serve for the crystal of Earth. But the worst parts are those moments when the wonky translation actually harms the story. There is one line in the English version that's so iconic, it's pretty much the original Final Fantasy meme. It's one of the most famous lines in all of gaming, but for all the wrong reasons. As Tella's beloved daughter Anna lies dying in the ruins of Castle Damsion, Prince Edward, the man she had run off to be with, appears. Mad with grief, Tella attacks the prince. When Edward tries to explain the situation, Tella cuts him off with this now infamous mistranslation. You spoony bard! I get it, it's a funny line, but it's not supposed to be a funny scene. We just saw Golbus slaughter an entire kingdom, Tella just lost his daughter, and Edward his true love. You spoony bard turns Anna's death into a joke and robs one of the game's best scenes of all emotion. To this day, it's unclear whether any native English speaker ever touched or even looked at the translation before the game was shipped. But as disastrous as this process turned out, something good did come from it. It was Final Fantasy IV's embarrassing translation that convinced Square they had to take localization seriously and led them to hire someone who was actually qualified to do the job. But that's a story for another time. Despite its horrible English translation, Final Fantasy IV's story was literally too good to ruin. Great moments and advanced storytelling lifted the game to new heights, but the real magic came from how these improvements were used to leverage the strength of what is really the most important part of any story. For the first time in the series, Final Fantasy IV featured fully developed characters. The heroes have thoughts, opinions, and motivations of their own, and they all have their own story to tell. Edward is a coward, who struggles to find his courage and become a worthy leader to his people. Rydia is a child, who has to grow up fast to survive. And Tella is a grieving father, who has a chance at redemption, but lets his thirst for vengeance blind him. Sure, the characters are mostly one-dimensional. Rosa is a paragon of virtue and self-sacrifice, Edge is a horny, self-important show-off, and Sid is a workaholic, loudmouth genius. But one-dimensional characters is still more than any of the previous games had, and one of the ways the game revolutionized the Final Fantasy series is in how all of this is conveyed. For the first time, not everything the characters say can be traced back to the needs of the plot. There's scenes with nothing but banter, like the one where Tella rejoins the party at Mount Ordeals. And for the first time, the heroes are the drivers of the story. Cecil chooses to part ways with the Kingdom of Baron after he is sent to destroy the Summoners of Mist. After Fabul's Wind Crystal is stolen by Golbez, the heroes gather to plan how to strike back, and after Cain's betrayal in the Underworld, it's Cecil who puts two and two together and figures out how to proceed. But it wasn't just about what the characters said, it was also about who they were. I already explained how Final Fantasy IV uses its battle system to tell the story, but there's more to it than that. It also uses the battle system to convey character. And here's where the decision to remove player choice and give each character a predefined job really paid off. Rosa is a healer, a person who puts the needs of others above her own. This is reflected not just in how she's portrayed in the story, but also in how she works in combat. As a white mage, she has limited offensive capabilities, but access to the most advanced healing spells and protective enchantments. 
In the same way, the fact that Rydia is a summoner is not just an interesting gameplay feature. It's an integral part of the story. Her village was targeted by Baron because they were summoners, and her entire character arc is built around her connection to the world of the monsters she summons in battle. But it wasn't just the characters themselves. It was also in how they interacted with each other. Because this story featured much stronger relationships between characters. At first, Tella blames Edward for causing his daughter's death. But later, he comes to respect Edward and understand why his daughter fell in love with him. Cecil and Cain begin the game as friends, but they are also rivals for Rosa's affection. Cain's jealousy eventually gets the best of him, as he succumbs to the mind control of the villain and betrays his friends not just once but twice, before finally coming to his senses. But the relationship that sticks out to me is the one between Cecil and Rydia. Rydia starts out hating Cecil for causing her mother's death and the burning of her village. But as she gets to know him better, she comes to see his pain and regret, and his commitment to keeping her safe. And when she later returns as an adult, she finds it in her heart to forgive him. Here we also get Final Fantasy's first real romance. Some of the later Final Fantasy games told great love stories, but none of them have done what Final Fantasy IV did show a hero and heroine who are already in a committed adult relationship. They share an intimate moment in Cecil's room at the start of the game, they embrace with joy when they're reunited in the Tower of Zot, and the game's epilogue even shows them getting married. There's also a great scene near the end where Cecil tries to convince Rosa not to take part in the dangerous final battle. For just a moment, you can pretend that Cecil and Rosa are real lovers having a real argument. Final Fantasy IV's intro shows soldiers invading a foreign country and killing innocent people. It's an introduction that paints a perfectly clear picture of what the story is about and who the bad guys are. Except that it isn't. Because Cecil is not the villain of this story, but its hero. And the moment the Dark Knight responsible for this horrible attack starts to show doubt and remorse over his actions was a monumental shift in the RPG genre. Console games in the early 90s didn't have anti-heroes or flawed characters with tragic backstories. Final Fantasy IV didn't just shatter your expectations. By showing Cecil's guilt and desire to change, the game invited you to care not just about how to beat the game, but about Cecil's personal salvation. Cecil Harvey is Final Fantasy's first true protagonist. While Final Fantasy II had an official, predefined hero in Firion, there was really nothing that made him more important to the game's story than Guy, or better yet Maria, who was the one who actually lost her brother to the Empire. But more importantly, Firion had no real character arc. In fiction, a character arc shows the gradual transformation of a character from one sort of person to another sort of person as a result of the things that happen in the story. Cecil's quest for redemption is one of gaming's first truly great character arcs, and his transformation from a dark knight bound by duty to a paladin who lets go of hatred is all the better for how it's told. Cecil is a person tormented by guilt. We know this because the game shows us. When Cecil meets with Rosa at night, we see his doubts about his actions in Mysidia. When he protects Rydia from the soldiers of Baron, we see his deep regret over the pain he's caused her. And when he finds himself back in Mysidia after being shipwrecked, we see he's willing to risk his life to break with his past and become a better person. Cecil's quest for redemption is powerful because you know how he feels. You know because you walk beside him all this way. And one of the highlights of the game is the scene where he takes that final step. The trial at Mount Ordeals. After fighting their way through Mount Ordeals and reaching the summit, the heroes find themselves transported inside a strange tomb with walls lined with reflective crystal. Here, Cecil is transformed from a Dark Knight to a Paladin and forced to confront the shadow of his own past in single combat. It's the very definition of a rite of passage, and has gone down in JRPG history as one of the most memorable scenes of all time. This scene is forever burned into my mind since I was a child. 
It's a moment where the story transcends the simple graphics and primitive sounds and comes alive through your imagination. A common criticism of Cecil's character arc is that it ends at Mount Ordeals well before the halfway point of the game, but I would argue that it doesn't. Cecil overcame his demons at Mount Ordeals, but becoming a paladin wasn't the end of his path to redemption, it was just the first step. Cecil's true trial isn't the battle at Mount Ordeals, but the rest of the game, and the task that Cecil sets for himself, the price for forgiveness, is the salvation of the world. This is best shown in Cecil's most important relationship, not the one he shares with Rosa, but the one he doesn't even know about when the story begins, his relationship to the game's antagonist. Final Fantasy IV's iconic twist is the true identity of the evil Galbes. Throughout the story, the heroes have many run-ins with the mysterious Dark Knight who seems to be the mastermind of all the world's troubles. Golbus is by far the most intimidating, proactive and frankly scary villain the series has had up to this point, but his motivation for hunting down the world's elemental crystals seems to be a mystery. And there's a good reason for this, because Golbus' mind is not his own. After chasing after the bad guy for almost the entire game, Cecil eventually learns that Golbus is his long-lost brother, and that he has been a victim of mind control. It's a great twist, especially for what it means for Cecil personally. When Tella dies at the Tower of Zot, Cecil swears vengeance against Golbes, and even after he learns the truth about Golbes, it's clear that he struggles to forgive his brother. On the surface, Cecil is a paladin fighting for justice, but on the inside, the battle that began at Mount Ordeals still rages on. Deep down, Cecil is still holding on to guilt and regret. At the very end of the game, when Golbus says farewell to Cecil, the former villain is essentially asking for his brother's forgiveness. When Cecil calls Golbus brother, it shows not just that he forgives Golbus, but that he forgives himself. Because this story is all about forgiveness. Takashi Tokita, lead designer of Final Fantasy IV, has said that their goal was to create an ultimate Final Fantasy, taking the best parts of the first three titles and putting them into the new game. And there sure are a lot of callbacks and references to the previous games in Final Fantasy IV. But Final Fantasy IV was much more than just a tribute to the earlier games, because it was here at last that the final ingredients were put into place for what would eventually make the Final Fantasy series one of the most successful video game franchises of all time. Because Final Fantasy IV is the blueprint to Square's success. Finally, all the critical elements of a modern blockbuster JRPG came together. An exciting combat system that keeps you on your toes and forces you to master the characters and abilities at your disposal. A more accessible experience without the need for excessive grinding or brutal dungeons that set you back hours when you die. A unique world that blends elements of fantasy, science fiction and modern day life. A fantastic soundtrack that adds power and emotion to every part of the game. Memorable characters that come to feel like old friends and above all, a carefully crafted, engaging narrative told through amazing set piece scenarios a great story and a unique experience that stays with you forever. This was the game that established the fundamental principle of the Final Fantasy series, gameplay in the service of story, a game where the story is the reward for playing. Final Fantasy IV might seem primitive today. In the shadow of games like Final Fantasy VI, VII and IX, Final Fantasy IV doesn't get nearly as much love anymore. But this game was incredibly ambitious, and for many, this was the first time they ever played a game that told a gripping story and made them care about the heroes. It was a masterpiece for its time, and at its heart, it carries a timeless message that's more relevant than ever today. Final Fantasy IV asks some pretty heavy questions. Can a person whose soul has been stained by darkness ever turn back to the light? Does being manipulated by evil excuse your actions? And is it ever too late to ask forgiveness? Final Fantasy IV is a story of second chances 
for Cecil, who killed the innocent in the name of his king, for Cain, whose jealous love made him an easy target for the villain's mind control, for Rydia, who lost everything but decided to keep going, for Edward, who wanted to become a better man, and for Tella, who had his chance but didn't take it. And ultimately, Final Fantasy IV is a story of forgiveness. It's the story of Cecil's redemption. It's a story about how no one is ever too far gone to save. A story about how it's never too late to change, to turn back and to ask forgiveness. To me, this is the message of Final Fantasy IV. None of us are perfect. We've all made so many mistakes. So don't give up. Don't look at the unknown road ahead and see darkness and fear. See the distant light on the horizon, the beautiful sights unseen, the hidden paths you might take. Don't look back to see the mistakes of your past as chains that hold you in place. Just keep moving. Because as long as you're taking even a single step forward, you're not lost. You're just finding your way. In the end, Final Fantasy IV is a game about paladins riding spaceships to fight dragons on the moon. And these are just my personal opinions. Whether you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear about your experiences with Final Fantasy IV in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.